Hello. As we get to this last part of the book of Philippians, we're going to spend our time, we're going to dwell uh, in these words. We're going to allow them to, to penetrate our hearts and our minds and our wills. We're going to go very slowly, but meaningfully, I hope, through these verses. So today, we're just going to look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, which says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let's pray. Father God, as we take this one line of scripture, this one sentence, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would speak deeply to us. Father, we give you full permission to speak deeply into our heart, to speak deeply into our mind, to unstop our ears that we may hear and be glad. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. I suppose if you heard these words out of context, rejoice in the Lord always, again, I will say rejoice. If you heard them and didn't know what had come before or didn't know anything about Paul's circumstance, you might think he's in a really good place. If I just heard this rejoice in the Lord, I could imagine him settling down, slumping into a deck chair on a beautiful beach. Ah, oh, rejoice in the Lord always. And I say rejoice. It would be so easy to imagine that that was Paul. And I think that's because many of us do that. We often find ourselves giving thanks for circumstances, not in the midst of circumstances. Paul is in prison. There are people stirring up trouble all around him. He told us that in verse 1. The book of Acts tells us not only is he under arrest, but that he has a Roman guard with him 24 hours a day. We're told in chapter 2 of Philippians that Paul feels like he is being poured out like a drink offering on a sacrifice. And the image is one from the Old Testament uh, of bringing the, the lamb or the oxen and then pouring blood on that oxen as it gets sacrificed to the Lord. He says, I feel like that. I feel like a drink offering being poured on the offering that was Jesus Christ on the cross. There's something of the depth of his agony. I'll never forget the phrase in Lord of the Rings where Bilbo on his 111st birthday says that he feels like, uh, like butter on toast that has been spread so thin. And just the preceding two verses have told us that in this church that he loves, there is conflict among good friends. He's not slumped in a de deck chair as he says rejoice. He is facing death, persecution, poured out like a drink offering, praying for peace in the church that he loves. This is a verse in conflict. Rejoice. Hmm. I wonder, where do you get your joy? What gives you joy? If you think about it meaningfully for just a few minutes, you'll realize the things that bring you joy are often good circumstances, are often good situations. 
I wonder what brings our culture joy if we were to think about that, the wider community, our nation, our, our world. What brings that joy? Well, often it's great sporting events, isn't it? it the, the winning a uh, gold in the curling brings us a great deal of joy, it seems. Winning uh, a World Cup would remove 50 four years, 56 years of pain for many an English person. It's interesting how our culture focuses on sport. I, I, I read this this week. This is from the opening ceremony program. It was written by Danny Boyle, the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympics. And he said this, we welcome you to an Olympic opening ceremony for everyone, a ceremony that celebrates the creativity, the eccentricity, daring and openness of British genius by harnessing the genius, creativity, eccentricity, daring and openness of modern London. We hope that through all the noise and the excitement, you'll glimpse a single golden thread of purpose, the idea of Jerusalem, of the better world, of the world of real freedom, and true equality, a world that can be built through the prosperity of industry, through the caring nation that built the welfare state, through the joyous energy of popular culture, through the dream of universal communication, a belief that we can build Jerusalem and that it will be for everyone. Wow. Stirring words from Danny Boyle at the 2012 Olympics. Boris Johnson, who was London mayor at the time, said that for a month, Britain was crop dusted with serotonin. There was so much joy. If we were to unpack this idea that Danny Boyle gives, this idea that I think really represents our culture's idea of joy, we will see that there is not one mention of God. Look at the things that he declares will bring this idea of a, of a new Jerusalem. He, he's deliberately taking biblical language, biblical hope, and stripping it entirely of anything to do with God or Jesus Christ or the power of eternity. He said this, I'll, I'll remind you, uh, Above the noise and excitement, you'll glimpse a single golden thread of purpose. The idea of Jerusalem, of the better world, the world of real freedom, true equality, a world that can be built. How? We're on tiptoes of expectation. How can this world be built? Through the prosperity of industry. That's another place our culture gets its joy, money prosperity of industry, through the caring nation that built the welfare state. Well, I like that, but it's stripped of God, the one who shows us true mercy and caring, through the joyous energy of popular culture. What does that mean? He's saying we get our joy through looking at our institutions, the NHS. We get our joy through money, and we get our joy through box sets and sport and movies and music. He goes on, he's got one more, through the dream of universal communication. He's saying if we could just all communicate with one another, then there would be joy. If you're old enough, you'll remember 2012. And it did seem such a good time. There was a collective joy, a collective hope. 10 years later, where is that hope now? Where have those dreams?
us, taken us. Is the world better place today than then? No. Our world is more fragmented. Our world is under more threat. Our world is a less safe, less hopeful, more fearful place. The places that we look for for joy the places we run to for hope, these become our gods and they're petty gods. They're counterfeit gods when we think of Jesus. Hmm. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Rejoice. What a beautiful phrase. Rejoice. If you renew your membership, you take it out again. If you renew your membership at the gym or with the AA or the RAC or, or Green Flag or any other organization, when you renew your membership, you do it again. If you in, reinstall windows on your computer or reinstall a program on your PC, you are putting it in again. If you are reinvesting in some stocks, it means you are doing it again. Do you see where I'm going? Rejoice in the Lord. He's saying, have joy in the Lord and build on that joy and keep building on that joy. If all the things that our culture runs after, sport or money, industry, jobs, culture, if all these things don't bring happiness, don't bring lasting joy, what will? Paul tells us, God will, joy will. Have you ever wondered that you might have been created for joy? Have you ever wondered that? I firmly believe the very reason you were made is to know joy. And I'm not alone. 500 years ago, a, a number of very godly men gathered together and they asked this question, what is the chief end of humanity? Why are we here? A and they said this, to know God and enjoy him forever. That's why you were made. You weren't made to be glitter on a dance floor. You weren't made to be a, a, a shouting, roaring watcher of football or a massive consumer of box sets. I'm not saying that any of those are necessarily wrong. But if they are the focus of your pursuit of joy, you are looking in the wrong place. You were made to know God and enjoy him forever. That's why a man who is in prison, who has lost everything, his family, his church, his money, can say rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. What is the secret of this? What is the, the mystery to this? Because it is a mystery. It is hidden from the eyes of so many people. But today, your eyes could be open to it. You could see this mystery that has been hidden from so, so many and know the secret of joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. That's the secret of joy.
Not rejoice in the Beatles, not rejoice in Coldplay, not rejoice in Manchester United or Newcastle United or England or Scotland or rugby. Rejoice in the Lord. Notice that this isn't words of suggestion. These are words of obligation. The language of command, rejoice in the Lord. That's what Paul says. I'm issuing a command, a, re- a command that demands a response, that you delight yourself in the Lord, that you find your joy in him. Funnily enough, uh, There's a psalm that says that, Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. What about that? So this is a a command, rejoice in the Lord. Make a decision with your will and not simply your emotions. Make a decision, Paul is saying, to be joyful whatever your circumstances. Now, maybe you hear that and you say, but Andy, you don't know my circumstances. You'd be quite correct. I don't. But I do know what Paul's circumstances were. He was facing death. We hear nothing else in the book of Acts after this imprisonment because he is killed. And he knows he is facing death. He's been told by Agabus, he knows that he's going to die. He said to live is Christ, to die is gain. He knows. Maybe your circumstances are like that. Maybe like Paul, you've lost everything. Maybe like Paul, you feel imprisoned. Well, he says... I want you to rejoice. He knows you can't rejoice for your circumstances. It's very hard to rejoice for the prisons we find ourselves in. It's very hard to rejoice for the loss that we experience. But he's saying in the midst of those circumstances, rejoice. So how do you and I do that? Well, I've got two things for us to think about of how we might do it from this passage. Rejoice in the Lord. So the first thing is, I think we need to have a change of perspective. We are really good, or I am really good, at seeing things from my own perspective. Uh, I have a a, a friend and uh, she had COVID and I wanted to drop in some food for her. And so I got her food that that I would like to eat, that my family would like to eat. Uh, I was looking at it from my perspective and I I dropped over uh, some curries for this person. I thought everybody likes curries. There was just one problem. These curries were full of almonds, and she is deadly allergic to nuts. What a fool. I was looking at it totally from my perspective, hadn't thought to ask. We're like that. We we look on this world from our vantage point. We do that all the time. And so we, we see the niggles and the grumbles of the world and we see them from our perspective. And we moan about them, don't we? I, it never ceases to amaze me how eloquent I can be when I'm grumbling. I, I can talk about my grumbles for hours. I can be really l- l- lucid about my grumbles. But am I as lucid about God? <laughs> I need a change of perspective. I need to look at things from his perspective. What is his 
perspective on our troubles. Well, God has pardoned us. God has provided for us. God has a sure and certain prospect for us. From God's perspective, we are safe, we are held, and we are loved. There is nothing that can happen to you that is outside of his purposes, outside of his will. Even when Job went through the deepest dark night of the soul, God was in charge. God had put limits on the mischievous, wrecking, painful actions of the devil. God was in charge and God was working his purposes out. So the very first thing we need to do when we are in these difficult situations and we find it really hard to have joy and build on that joy to rejoy and rejoy and rejoy is to try and look at our situation from God's perspective to bring him in. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in his ways. Rejoice in his purposes. Rejoice in his plan. Rejoice in his provision. Rejoice in his prospect. Rejoice in his pardon. That's one thing we can do. Rejoice in the Lord always. So there's something about this command that is continuous. It's not just something that we do once and think everything is going to be all right. We live in such an instant culture where we want everything delivered today. We want things done ASAP. We want instant gratification. We want it now. But here Paul is saying, rejoice in the Lord always. This is a call to continual perseverance for joy in the Lord. Now, if I was just to change one word in this, joy in the Lord, and change that word Lord to Jesus, I wonder if it becomes slightly more obvious to us what we're to do. Not only are we to have a different perspective, and not only are we to keep going with this, persevering patiently in rejoicing, but we are to rejoice in Jesus. I'll be really honest with you. I, at times, suffer from depression. There is a hole in my soul and a sadness about me. The answer for me, the way out of depression for me is gazing on the face of Jesus. When I'm in prisons of depression, self-doubt, self-loathing, and I look at him, joy begins to surface. Not immediately. It takes patient perseverance. But joy begins to come and rejoy begins and rejoy and rejoy and building on joy, joy upon joy upon joy as I think, meditate, gaze on him. In one of these darkest nights, the soul, I found it really hard to look at scripture. I found it really hard to listen to Christian music. 
there was a, like a wall put up. I, I couldn't engage, but I knew I needed to. And everything that I'd taught for, for all the years before said I, I had to. This was the route out of my depression. Do you know what I did? I picked up a ladybird book. If you are, if you're British, you know about ladybird books. I, I'm not so sure about other, other nations, but a ladybird book, these are like the first books that a child is given. And this was given to me by my godparents. August 1972, to Andrew with love. And I read about Jesus. There are beautiful pictures, but the pictures aren't what I gazed at. I gazed at the words. Listen to this. The friend of children. Jesus was the friend of children. He smiled to see them playing games. They knew he was their very own friend. Everyone loved him and wanted to be near him. When the children saw Jesus coming along the road, they stopped playing and ran fast to meet him. I read those words and thought, if Jesus welcomes children, he'll welcome me. I read on. Jesus was the friend of mothers and fathers too. He listened when they told him about their children. A father said, my little boy is ill, please come. Will you please come and make him well? Jesus was glad to make the boy well again. He made many other children better too. He loved them all. Now, it's not scripture, but it reminded me of scripture. It reminded me of this one who came and every parent who asked him for help, he gave it. Every child that came to him, even when the disciples pushed them away and said, he's too busy for you. Jesus opened his arms too. And from this children's book, I began to gaze again at my Savior. I began again to look and read about him, to examine his names in scripture, to feast myself on him, build myself up in him. He is like a diamond. Whichever way you look at him, there is beauty and there is treasure. Wherever you hold it up to the light, there is beauty and rainbows so much bigger than it seems. The multifaceted faces of our beautiful Lord Jesus. Think with me for a moment. Some of the ways that he talked about himself as the good shepherd who carries lambs. Do you need to be carried? He said that he was a friend. I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. I'm blessed with some great friends. Friends I can pray with, friends I can talk to, friends I can laugh with, friends I can pour out my troubled soul to. Jesus says I'm like that, but more so. <laughs> Calls himself water. You thirsty, you parched. Is life empty? meaningless. It says, come to me. I'll give you living water. He met a wonderful woman one day. She had no friends. She had been married five times. The fellow she was with now was, was not even her husband. People were suspicious of her. They called her names. While other women went to the well, in the cool of the morning, she went at midday because they would just hurl insults at her. 
Jesus was her friend. Jesus had to meet her. Jesus spoke to her and he said, if you knew who it was who spoke to you, I would have given you living water. Think about the things he said about himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's incredibly exclusive. There is no other way to Father God except through Jesus. Think about the things the Father says about Jesus Christ. This is my son. With him I am well pleased. That's incredible. It, it, it seems that God the Father gets joy from looking at the Son. Have you thought that? With him I am well pleased. I delight in him. This is my beloved Son in whom I delight. If God, the maker of heaven and earth, delights when he gazes at his Son, how much more should we look to him and know joy? Look at what the Holy Spirit says about Jesus. In the book of Revelation, the Spirit reveals him as lion and lamb. The lion, the strong, invincible leader. The lamb, the meek, the meek and mild, humble sacrifice who was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Feast your heart on him. Feast your eyes on him. So we change our perspective. We stop looking at this world through our eyes and start to look at the world through God's eyes as revealed in scripture. And we change our focus. We focus away from our problems and focus our hearts, our souls, our strength, our eyes on Jesus Christ. We focus on his beauty, his splendor, his glory, his love. We drink deeply from the well of living water. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in Jesus always. Keep going. Don't give up. Again, I say rejoice. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, let my heart, my soul, my strength, my eyes be fixed on you. Increase my love for you. Help me to see beyond my own eyes, to look on this world, and to look upon myself afresh from your perspective. Give me strength, O oh Lord, to keep going, to not give up, but to patiently persevere in joy in you. Amen.